morning, everyone. Uh, it feels great to be here. Uh, we are really excited to present our journey of how we built housing.com, the mobile version. Uh, OK. So I'm Rahul. I lead the front end team at housing. Uh, as the name suggests, we are into home buying. And for most of our users, home buying is a once in a lifetime event. And it's a long journey before they settle for their dream home. Uh, we have native apps to facilitate that experience uh, with native performance, better re-engagement, and offline experience. But we also had few challenges, like poor internet connections, mostly 2G and 3G, and low-end devices in terms of computation, memory, and storage. So these kept our users from downloading our apps and thus hindered our business to reach their goals. We also had our mobile website, uh, which looks something like this. Uh, the problem with this was it, it was a monolithic code base, having desktop and mobile uh, tangled together. And the components were kind of bloated because of the ifs in JavaScript and the media queries in our CSS. And that eventually affected our performance. Right? So we thought about uh, we have to cater the growing need of our uh, user, mobile user base. And we chose to upgrade our mobile website to something that can compete with our native apps. Uh, the reason being simple, web has uh, better discovery and a wider user, ba user base uh, than any other platform. Also, the cost of bringing a user to our mobile web was 50 times cheaper for us than bringing the same user to our native apps. So uh, it, it was the deal breaker. Like uh, We started off building our mobile website. The first and the foremost thing that we had was to support all the major browsers that are out there uh, that our users use on more than 2,000 2, different devices that they have. So this was our first aim. And then we thought, once we have this part done, we'll upgrade that experience to compete with our native apps. Uh, so we built Housing Go. Uh, and we were happy uh, with the kind of metrics that we saw. We were able to bring down our page load times by 30%. We, are, we were having 10% longer user sessions. And the bounce rate was cut down to 40%. On top of all this, the most important part was 38% more conversions on our mobile website. That really helped our business realize the goals much sooner and effectively than earlier. And yeah, I'd like to call up on stage Ritesh, who will be taking us through the journey of how we built this. Good morning. So uh, I'm Ritesh. I'm a front-end developer at housing.com. So let's talk about how we actually built it. From the start, we were focusing on four key, uh, key areas. Uh, the first one is that we wanted to deliver assets fast. Then we wanted to bring down the time to first meaningful paint, uh, and also the first JS-enabled interaction time. And at the same time, we had to improve the experience of our returning users. So. Uh, most of the other performance metrics actually depend on when is your asset delivered. So this is a waterfall of a traditional website. First, your whole HTML loads, and then other asset requests goes. So you have to wait for whole HTML to load before making a request. So when you analyze your code, you'll find that there's a certain part of your code that needs no computation or no API request. Uh, so let's talk about HTML streaming. Now, this is how it looks like on client side. Uh, first, we send the initial chunk uh, that only contains, uh, contains the code that needs no computation. You can see there's pre-connect, preload, and the critical inline CSS. Now, sending the preload, we actually uh, start the request for critical JavaScript earlier. I will talk about uh, them. So now, this is the full HTML. After the server has made API requests, and uh, it has received all the responses. It sends all the HTML. Uh, now, this has body, initial one didn't had, uh, and this has all the content. Now, the size of full HTML is around 15 KB, but the first response that the server sent was around 4.2 KB. This is zip. Uh, so preload. Most of the time, the developers already know that a particular route is going to need a few critical resources. You can. Uh, load them in advance, and 
So uh, by using HTML streaming and preload in combination, we were able to start the request for critical JS much earlier than other assets. So after we were done with uh, asset delivery, we went ahead to improve our render time. And by render, I mean the first meaningful paint. Now the difference between first paint and first meaningful paint. On the left side, you see that that's first paint. First paint is anything, when there's anything, any pixel available on your phone, most of the time that's not relevant. And user feels like waiting. And uh, when the relevant content is there, that's the first meaningful paint. Now we wanted to zero down the difference between these two. So we experimented with server-side rendering. Uh, I am saying experimented because you should always measure before you Im implement. So this is a traditional app shell model uh, on first load. Till 2.2 seconds, there's a white screen of death. You have nothing to see. Then there's a state where you have something, but it's not relevant to the user. He still has to wait. And around seven seconds, he sees the first meaningful content. Now, the region before 2.2 seconds and seven seconds is what we call the loading screen of purgatory. So, so the user doesn't know what's going to happen. He may receive the content. He has to wait for a certain amount of time. And if there's any error, he will have to wait in that state forever. So we wanted to improve this. We wanted to remove this totally. So this, this is after SSR enabled. Now, uh, when we impl implemented server-side rendering, the first meaningful paint happened at 2.3 seconds. And that was quite an improvement. And this, uh, all these tests have been run with uh, web page test. Uh, uh, the, it's written on the bottom. So, so the, there's also a bonus that when we implement a server-side rendering that uh, the basic meaningful content is available for everyone. I mean, uh, as Rahul said, that we have users using more than 2,000 types of devices. And so there are a variety of users uh, with different browsers. The versions may be older ones. So the basic content of, is rendered for all of them. So that's a bonus. So till now, I've talked in bits and pieces about how we improve JS-enabled uh, interaction. But the main thing that you need to do uh, for improving JS-enabled interaction is that uh, you need to ship less code, less JS. So lesser the JS, faster will be the interaction time. Now, when you ship uh, less code, you will have to lazy load resources on demand. And this brings us to code splitting. We are using Webpack 2 for code splitting. And we do both JS and CSS sharding. So generally, the chunks that we make, uh, we divide them into two categories. Uh, the first one of them is route-based chunks. Now, when a user lands to a particular route, first we make a call for the main JS file that that view will require. And in parallel, we make a request for the corresponding CSS file. So when the CSS file has been loaded, we allow the navigation. And after his idle, uh, we make a call for the next probable route that he might navigate to, so that when the user uh, navigates to that route, the transition is almost instant. So next, I come to the second category. That's intent-based chunks. Now, these are the chunks that are only required when the user does a particular kind of interaction, like scrolling or click, uh, and doesn't involve any route change. Now, let's take an example. Uh, this is a, our listings page. Now, on top right, you can see a notify button. Now, by analytics data, we know that this is a kind of button that gets clicked once in few sessions. And the corresponding view that it requires has, it's of 32 KB unzip. So it makes no sense to, to load that with the main JS bundle, because most of the times it will go unused. So we require it only when the user has clicked on that particular button. Uh, so after doing all this, currently we are at a stage where our first meaningful paint happens at around 2.3 seconds. And the first uh, the JS enable interaction starts at around 4.2 seconds. Now, by JS enable interaction here, uh, I don't mean the DOM content loaded. We have uh, defined a custom metric, like we, we calculated this when the component actually mounts. Like, since we are using React, uh, it, for us, it is actually component did mount. So this is, the this is the time when the component did mount gets triggered. 
So I've talked about how we push critical resources using preload. Uh, we have improved render using uh, SSR and inlining critical CSS. Uh, we are pre-caching uh, assets using service workers, as Raul will tell you. And we are lazy loading uh, resources on demand. So we are very much uh, near to what the purple pattern promotes. And so till now, what I have discussed has improved the experience of first-time users. Now, we also had to improve the experience of returning users. So I'll call back Rahul to tell you more about that. Yep. Uh, so as I told you, finding a dream home is a long journey. Uh, user comes online multiple times to make his searches, to compare the houses he's seeing, the property he's seeing. Uh, so it was very important for us to make a compelling returning uh, uh, returning user experience so that uh, we make that journey as smooth as possible. Uh, we use service workers to pre-cache few resources on install and uh, act as a proxy for our subsequent network resources so that, and so that it can serve them from the cache directly when it's requested second time. Uh, by doing this, we have uh, been able to bring down the first meaningful pain that happens for a first-time user at around 2.2 seconds to 700 milliseconds and the first JS enabled interaction from 4.2 seconds for a first time user to 1.1 seconds. Uh, this, this <laughs> uh, so uh, yeah, we also uh, implemented add to home screen features to give users to the access to instantly uh, interact with our app directly from their home screens. And we implemented push notifications. Uh, I like to mention that uh, the kind of conversion rates that we are having from push notifications are almost beating few few other channels that we have. So that's that's one thing that's taking us closer to our apps. Uh, the offline navigation. Uh, this was important for us because whenever you, a user visits for the actual site visit, uh, the properties are generally at the outskirts of cities where we, uh, the network is very flanky or uh, absolutely no network. So this experience helped them to actually or revisit their session, or re-look the properties they have already done on, on the mobile. We use Credentials Management API to keep our users uh, almost logged in virtually almost every time, so that uh, their information is synced across devices very uh, smoothly. Yep. So once we were done building uh, the app, it, the main question that we had is, how do we maintain this? We have done a lot of things to uh, maintain the uh, first uh, first pain time, first JS enable interaction time, but as uh, as the product evolves with lot of lot of features, the, it's very difficult to keep in check these metri metrics. So we came up with our own system of uh, uh, continuous integration with Webpack and Web Page Test, and we made it as easy as just putting a label on a PR in GitHub. So if you if you are done with your code and you raise a PR. You just need to put a label run test, and we'll put out all the information that needs to track, track these metrics right on, on the uh, GitHub PR, like the chunk sizes. Uh, it helps a reviewer uh, know that how this PR is changing or modifying the chunk sizes that we already serve. Uh, the uh, few route-based statistics, like the first paint, uh, when what's the speed index of the uh, few of the critical routes that we take care of. Also, the network and the timeline view. This helps uh, the reviewer get an essence of what resources and are loading and how they are loaded. So I think this was very important to us uh, to close the loop of the complete development uh, from the development and maintenance. Uh, yeah, it's, it's uh, not always, uh, we, we are yet to do a lot of things to make the app faster. And one of the uh, things that we are experimenting is moving from React to Preact. Uh, we, we have seen that in our initial prototypes, moving from React to Preact has brought down uh, a difference of 122 KB in our, in our vendor bundle. And that's huge. Like That's around 700 to 800 milliseconds of JS enable interaction time gain on the client side. Uh, we are also uh, experimenting with AMP uh, to let our users have uh, almost in instant uh, uh, experience when they come through Google Google results page. So, thank you, thank you all.
Hello. Over here. Hello. Um, Jake, are you there? Yeah, Paul. I'm here. OK. Uh, we were asked to do a quick handover, so we've cut the bit where we walk on stage. Yeah. Uh, that was housing.com. Uh, and here's Lyft. Yay! Well, good morning, everyone. I'm Malcolm Ong, uh, product manager at Lyft. And here with me today is my colleague, Mozin Azimi, uh, lead engineer on our project. And we're going to tell you a little bit about our journey of how we built our progressive web app at Lyft. So just a show of hands, how many of you have taken Lyft before? Ah, okay, a lot of you. Yeah, awesome. Um, well, for those of you unfamiliar, Lyft is the fastest growing on-demand transportation service in the US. Um, it actually came out of a hackathon project from our original product, Zimride. And so similarly, our ride.lift project also came out of a company hackathon. And so certainly in the very beginning when we came up with the idea, there was a lot of internal skepticism as to you know, why we would build a web app at all. Uh, you know, could we, if we did, could we actually build a web app that would be a viable alternative to our native apps? And certainly, this makes sense, because historically, Lyft's been a native, mobile-first company, has invested a lot of time, resources, and set, uh, et cetera, on the native apps. And so you know, we said, well, let's go ahead and take a stab at it and see what we come up with. And I think we're pretty happy with our work. This is a, a desktop view of the app that we built. And our hackathon project gathered enough internal excitement that we said, you know, why don't we go, out, go ahead, go out, try to productize this, and see if our users would also be just as excited. And so some of the reasons why we built this, right? From our standpoint, a PWA could be a great supplement to native apps for various reasons. Number one, greater reach. So essentially allowing a lot of our users uh, that are unsupported or on aged out devices to use Lyft. Number two, reduce friction. So certainly pushing users through an app store funnel is very, very inefficient. And number three, faster uploads um, and experimentation. Right. So let's talk through each of these. So greater reach uh, on the pie chart that you see on the right, approximately 8% of iOS users in the market and 3% of Android users will soon be unsupported as we slowly deprecate older OS versions. Right. So our progressive web app allows us to support these users. Uh, furthermore, 100% of Windows Mobile and 100% of Amazon Fire devices, for example, uh, simply because we never had an uh, Amazon Fire app until our PWA, and we still don't yet have a native uh, app in Windows Mobile either. So this allows us to support these users. And in addition to this, obviously, it reduces a lot of operational costs, technical costs, resources, because it means less code and potentially less incidents or support tickets. Number two, reduce friction. So as we all know, sending users through an app store funnel is highly inefficient. There's high drop-offs, high cost per installs. And so the, the funnel that you see on the right there, we can potentially go from six steps, right, starting from web entry all the way down through the app store towards sign up and finally a first ride. So it's been said that every step of this funnel, you could essentially lose 20% of your users. And so what are, what are reasons for this? I mean, maybe it's because, I don't know, users don't like the permissions that you're asking about. Or maybe it's because they don't have enough storage on their phones. Uh, they have all those Snapchat videos that they you know, saved. Um, so we can basically change this to the three-step process, if you will. So in other words, imagine the PWA can replace the white portion of that funnel. Uh, another interesting thing is deep linking. So imagine we had a developer partner app like Google Maps, and Google Maps has integrated Lyft, and they want to send users to a seamless experience from Google Maps to Lyft, right? Right now, if you don't have the app installed, it sends you to the App Store. Uh, very, very, you know, not as seamless as, as it could be. So deep linking from developer partner apps straight into our progressive web app is a much more seamless experience to do that. Um, and finally, faster deploys. So certainly, deploying fixes, code, experiments on web takes hours, not weeks. There's no need for this you know, app approval process, if you will. And so running experiments faster, A-B testing, and certainly our app is always up to date. 
you don't have to constantly update your app. And in terms of you know, productivity and timeline, our team actually just started with just basically one engineer, Mosin. And you know, our alpha MVP that he built was built on top of an Angular stack, uh, primarily because Lyft's historically been on Angular. And we were able to do that in roughly two months' time. And so we proved that our PWA had a lot of promise, right? Uh, we, you know, of course, ate our own dog food, used a lot of our, leveraged our public API to handle a lot of the server side things. We had a little bit of support from like design and QA. But for the most part, you know, this was pretty quick compared to developing an native app. And so once we quickly proved the potential of this, we got enough internal support to get more engineers on the team and worked on a new app, a beta version of this, from the ground up in React and was able to do this in you know, roughly one month's time. And so now I'd like to bring out Mosin to talk a little bit more about the technical aspects of the app. Hello, everyone. I'm here to tell you a story. A story about a ride. Meet Valerie. She just saw DJ Khaled is giving undercover lift rides. So she want to try, maybe he's her driver. So she goes to lift.com. And what we have in lift.com is this big pink button that says, request a ride. We don't force users to download the app. They can just request a ride right there in the web. This is really important. Because if we force them to download the app, they had to download almost 75 megabytes of data just to start. So this is where PWA wins. You might think, OK, if she downloads the iOS app, it's going to be a better user experience. It's going to load faster. But in fact, our PWA loads faster than our iOS app. This is under LT network with a good device. But with slower networks and slower devices, we get good results, acceptable results. So now that she's, on, she's in our PWA, she needs to sign up. For sign up in Lyft, we ask for your phone number and a payment method. If you have your web payment set up, you don't need to put in your credit card. Just use Android Pay with Web Payment API. So she can do that. With two taps, she has an account, and she can pay for her ride. When she requests a ride, oh, I forgot about this. Uh, I talked about how the PWA is a better user experience, and that means in any front, animations, anything is the same as the uh, native app. OK, so now that she wants to take a ride, when she taps request ride, what we do is we register the service worker that listens to push notifications from our servers. So if her driver is coming in two minutes, she can put her phone in the pocket and wait for the driver to come in. When driver is here, we send this push notification that let her, lets her know that driver is here. This push notification do another thing. It has a payload that updates the right information in our app. So that means if she taps on this pay, push notification, we are going to take her to our PWA without making any network request, because push notification had all the data. When she's done with the ride, we also send a push notification. That push notification as well includes rides information. So even if she's offline, she can open up our PWA and access this screen, which has all the information about the ride, who the driver was, how much it cost, and things like that. This is really cool. But it doesn't stop here. Thanks to background sync, she can submit her feedback while she's offline. 
When she do does this, what we do in the service worker is we are making a post request, putting it in the cache, and then service worker is going to wait for online events. When that happens, this post request is going to be submitted. This is without her interaction. It's happening in background. I think this is really, really cool. So making this progressive web app was a really, really interesting journey for us. We are doing it for about two months. It's very early. But we learned so many lessons that I want to share a few of them with you. As other speakers here told you, less JavaScript is better. As much as we love to add new libraries and new dependencies to our code, we should always be considered about the amount of JavaScript we push to our users. This is really, really important for mobile users. Your regular MacBook Pro that you develop on is way more faster than the phone that your users are using. That's why in Lyft, we are using real devices for development and testing. We forbid ourselves from using our Macs or these powerful computers um, for development. It's not the most pleasant experience, but that's a user experience we are working on. Another thing that we did was minification. I'm sure all of you minify your JavaScript. But we did something new, which is thanks to Angular team with their um, TypeScript to Clojure compiler annotated JavaScript project. With that, we were able to minify JavaScript even further. A method name in minified regular minification process will not change, because job minifier will doesn't know where this method is being called, so it can't rename it all over the place. But with TypeScript and Clojure Compiler, we were able to minify it even further. The other thing that we did with JavaScript was tree shaking, which is now much easier than before with Webpack and the new minifiers. Here is a quick look of our technology stack. We are not using a lot of dependencies, as I said. Just React, a little bit of Webpack, and things are working pretty great. Our bundle size is less than 40 kilobytes gzipped. Thank you. We had challenges doing this work, too. The biggest challenge was other, the other platform. Uh, <laughs> But at the same time, all these PWA APIs are pretty, pretty new. And sometimes we saw MDN documents out of the, are out of date. There is not much Stack Overflow questions to look for. We just ask questions, don't get answers. Um, so that, but that is an interesting challenge to have. The other one we can't, is not in our control. So hopefully, that's going to be fixed next year. Um, I have one little uh, lesson we learned, and that is animation for opacity. If you use CSS animation for opacity infinitely, it's going to crash your browser. <laughs> <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> so now I'm going to hand it over to Malcolm to talk about business impact of this PWA. Thank you, everyone. All right, thank you, Mozin. And so putting this all together, what was our early business impact? Uh, the initial response from our alpha was certainly very, very positive. We you know, exceeded our initial weekly rides, number of weekly rides goal by 5x. We were able to launch a app, essentially a wrapper around our PWA, into the Amazon Fire App Store very, very quickly. And if you're interested, there's a link up there to learn more. And finally, we estimate that we'll have a, up to a 50% improvement in force upgrade churn. So this is, again, folks that we eventually have to force upgrade due to having lower or older uh, OSs. 
And so next steps, you know, this is certainly still a very, very early beta. We're still iterating on it a lot. Uh, it will be buggy, but, you know, we encourage you to try it out. Number one, for next steps, we definitely like to prove and optimize our conversion funnels. Number two, experiment a lot, right? And number three, finally start adding a lot more features onto this so that we can actually reach feature parity with our native apps. And so I wanted to thank everyone here for listening. Um, you know, some of our team members will be here at the conference later today to answer any questions you might have or just chat. And if you'd like to give it a try, just go to ride.lyft.com. And in fact, we have a coupon code for you to use for 20% off your ride. All right, thanks everyone. Yeah.